Thank you. As uh, Larry mentioned, I am new to the party. I'm new to activism, new to politics. And I'm going to um, ask your forgiveness up front that something that has helped me a lot when I'm new to an environment is labels. And so labels have really helped me navigate who am I dealing with and what needs to get done. So uh, two labels, uh, two sets of labels, two pairs of labels I'm going to use today are progressives and establishment or centrist. Um, when I became an active member of my party, I just happened to notice that certain people voted the way I voted. And in the conversations I had, things made more sense to me when I had certain conversations with a segment of the population than others. And so that helped me feel like I found my peeps because it's platform. It's not people. It's not personality. It's platform. It's what we believe in. And so in navigating that in my local party, uh, two other labels that I find exceptionally helpful are people of color and white people. For the sake of argument, you may have a lot of things in your blood, but there are people who are white passing or white appearing that enjoy a certain privilege that people of color do not. And in joining my party, one of the first things I noticed was that we are incredibly white. And this is Portland, Oregon. We are the whitest large city in America, but that is no excuse. And so the reason that these labels became important to me is because in working with my local party, the challenge, the task that I um, took on myself is to racially diversify the party. But since I've become active, I am a whole lot more interested in what progressive ideals are going to be able to do for my country and in working with progressive people. So here is the disappointment that was um, that that I struggle with still and the hope that as progressives, we are not great about talking about race and racism and taking on difficult conversations particularly if you are somebody who identifies or can pass as someone who is white. Now, why is it important for us to be able to talk about race and take this on? Well, one of the things I'm going to ask you to think about is you hear our speakers today and our candidates. If it wasn't for diversity, not only would we not have the quantity of candidates we have who identify as people of color, but the quality, the depth of what they bring. It is in our best interest to diversify and to be more inclusive for people who are racially different, not just because of the qualitative experience for somebody like me who is trying to do exactly what we all collectively are trying to do, but for quantity. We need more people. People of color have felt disenfranchised by the Democratic Party in a way that feels like we're tricked. We don't have a choice. We haven't had a choice. We have had to vote Democratic. We're not going to vote Republican. But when you hear African-Americans saying you only come around to talk to me every four years because you need my vote, they're right. That is also the sentiment in the brown community. I know because I've been reaching out. So what I feel is hope for the progressives. When I say the Democratic Party needs to racially diversify, I'm talking about us, folks, because we need to take over. This is about us taking over our county, our state, and our country. If we're going to take over, you need us. I promise you what we bring is going to be bring this party to a place that it's been needing to go. We have got to be better than the establishment and centrist Dems when it comes to how we welcome and include people of color. And folks, that bar is really low. So it's not going to take too much for us to be better than centrist and establishment Dems in our takeover and our inclusion of more people who don't look and sound like uh, majority culture. How can we do that? One of the pieces, and here's where I'm going to get a little more prescriptive. In your organization, whatever it is, in your family, in your community, we need common understandings. We need some language and vocabulary. So if nothing else, please look up critical race theory. Critical race theory really captures what I believe progressives believe about white privilege 
and power and oppression. And I'm getting some thumbs up and some amens. I can feel it. Uh, Dialogue. What we need as people of color is for you as white people to talk to other white people about what you know. I know I may be speaking to the lowest common denominator when I say we are incredibly white and we don't have a clue. So I am speaking to the lowest denominator. Maybe you're not on that end of the spectrum. If you're the woke end of the spectrum, then I ask, what are you going to do? for your white brothers and sisters to understand what you know in the skin that you're in, in the position that you're in, what is yours to do? The candidates of color have taken huge risks. They take a risk that you don't take when you run for office. Their families, their safety is at a different level of vulnerability than a white candidate. So please recognize that it's a different construct. Um, We have got to use a racial equity lens in everything that we do. That is, if you're in a room of all white people, which is very typical in Portland, Oregon, um, you need to ask who's missing, what perspective is missing, and what voice do I need to bring? You need to interrupt racism at Thanksgiving table too. So I'm going to give you the quick ACT recipe. When you hear something that's said that's racist, Don't call names. Don't call someone a racist. You need to act, A-C-T. Acknowledge what they said, even if it's just repeating it verbatim. Clarify what they meant. So when you said this, what did you mean? Tell me more. And the last part of A-C-T is take a stance and say what you believe. For you to be able to do that as an individually, as an individual, you need to explore your own whiteness. For us collectively to be racially responsive, culturally competent, we need common language and common understandings. So reflecting on whiteness and privilege as an individual leads to a collective reflection that can move that dial. And the last two pieces is, please do homework. There is a microaggression that a racial microaggression called teach me please. One of the things that white people do is have a person of color, tell them everything that I need to know about the Hispanic culture. Talk to me about why people feel disenfranchised and not welcome in the party. Do your homework if you want to learn about the Latino uh, situation, the black Americans uh, sentiment around Democrats. But please, people of color are exhausted. Making them your teacher is a racial microaggression, however well-intentioned it may be. And again, teach each other from whites to whites. And um, the last piece that we can do is believe in what we're already doing. I promise you I'm the worst critic when it comes to whiteness and white institutions and the ability to include people of color. We as progressives have the foundation, but we can't be comfortable where we are. It's an area in which we need to grow. And so the last thing I want to say is that if I were invited to a centrist or establishment event to speak, I can almost guarantee the group of candidates that I would be celebrating wouldn't look as diverse as it does today. This is a sign of who we are, but we do need to get better. So wherever we are, individually and collectively, We just need to take a step forward. We don't have to be perfect. This is messy stuff. You're going to make mistakes, but we will hold you with care, push you respectfully. But I'm asking, please consider the whiteness of our group, what power it brings, what challenge it brings, and what we can do about it in the skin that you're in, in the position that you're in. What is yours to do? And I thank you for giving me the time here today.